Get ready for a whole new experience at this year's Festival of Homiletics in person and online, May 16th to 20th. Join us in Denver, Colorado, or online from wherever you are. This year's theme is After the Storm, Preaching and Trauma. And it will feature Otis Moss III, Nadia Boltz Weber, Robert Wright, and Raphael Warnock. This year, the festival will draw up to 1,200 colleagues in person and thousands more online for preaching, worship, and dialogue to help you develop a hands-on way to engage trauma in your own ministry context. Other speakers include William Barber II, Anna Carter Florence, Lauren Winner, Emily and Amelia Nagoski, and many more. Make plans for this incredible learning experience with top teachers. Join us in Denver or online. Go to www.festivalofhomiletics.com for registration and details. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. This is the podcast for the fifth Sunday after the Epiphany, February 6, 2022. The first reading is Isaiah 6, 1 through 8, or you can go to 13, Psalm 138, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11, and Luke 5, 1 through 11. Down by the lakeshore. Yes, the calling of the disciples in, in Luke uh, chapter 5. And uh, so it's a familiar story and in, in some ways and the way it gets uh, kind of played out in, in the Gospels. Uh, one of the things that I find so interesting about this passage, I don't know, that stuck out to me uh, this time is Simon's response. Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Uh, and well, that's after, you know, Jesus says, put out in the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And, uh, and Simon says, well, we have been, you know, we've been doing this all night long and caught nothing. Yet, if you say so, <laughs> if you say so, and I don't, there's something about that, that in this calling of the disciples that I, the way in which we kind of, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe romanticize is not the right word, but that we, the, the way in which we imagine this, the, the calling of the disciples or the, how did that play out or even our own sense of call. And we can, we can, we can talk about that too, in terms of the, that's not always like the, you know, the heavens parting and the angels calling to you and everything is, is wonderful. We all know that, but I, I was just really struck by those words in terms of of the of the call to obedience and this and this response if you say so then i will do it and and sometimes that's maybe that's in part what what our relationship looks like with god and with jesus that there is this this call to obedience or that we're listening for that call or we're listening for that uh that direction and and it's and while there might be resistance on our part or misunderstanding, what would happen if we just said, if you said so? And, uh, and for me, it recalled a little bit the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness and in, in, in Jesus' own embodiment of obedience to God and his identity um, and, knowing, and, and knowing who uh, God is and his identity caught up with that. And, and that obedience leads him to uh, resistance. Um, and so that's, I don't know, that's, that's my first so, thought on this passage. So I have a question for that. How would you read this? How do, uh, I know uh, it's a great uh, question, isn't it? Read verse five. How would you say it? If you're actually not just, uh, wah, wah, wah. if you're actually yeah, like, no, I would, it. I would really emphasize it. That's, I mean, that's exactly right. Like master, we have worked all night long but have caught nothing <laughs> and i would like maybe uh i maybe like ad lib a little bit and like did you have you looked at the nets have you looked in the boat have you you know where have you been like there is nothing here there's a time to give up and go home not that i'm an angler but i think there is 
maybe there isn't, maybe just stick it out for all eternity. But, but uh, yeah, to really kind of, and really kind of emphasize that yet, if you say so, if you say yeah. so. So I yeah, tell- I would, I would play with that. I think of my 17 year old, no matter what I ask him to do, if you say and so. he has the uh, unfortunate, uh, he, he has the unfortunate gift of being the only one that's truly able-bodied in our family. So, so uh, the girls have bad backs. And of course I, uh, I'm an amputee. So he has to do all the heavy lifting, literally. And he, he, whenever I ask him to do something, he said, he always goes, do I have to, or do I have to do it right now? Yeah. <sighs> You say so. I, 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 well, I remember a, a button that my kids gave me at one point in time that I, that it was something along the lines of, of being a mother, right? And, and the, the laws of mother said is, you know, why, why? Because I said so. No, why do yeah. I have to do this? Because I said so. <laughs> That's just the way it is. So, I would anyway. be the guy too on the boat who'd be, what do these do? What do the nets do? How does this work? Hey, how does this do? Can we do it? Let's go out and try this. We should do this. It'd be fun to try this. And they're like, you know, the implied premise here is, you know, we do this for a living, right? Uh, but I hear, I hear obedience. Absolutely. I also hear exhaustion mm-hmm. in what Peter says. And I hear a lot of exhaustion in a lot of people in ministry right now mm-hmm. who are, uh, who are tired of going back and forth into the deep water and back in and, and the ways in which uh, the pandemic has, has, has changed so much of how we do ministry and so much of how we plan ahead and how much of how we measure success or faithfulness or, or whatever that looks like. And so there is a kind of like, seriously, you know, we were working before you got here. We took you out in the boats. So you could have a little pulpit in the water, which made you feel special and gave you a better vantage point. And now you want to go and do this. Uh, and then of course, the surprise of, of the, the amount of fish is, is shocking. And we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about Peter's response and compare that to Isaiah perhaps, but the, 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 the walking away part after that is kind of amazing to me. All of these call stories are slightly different uh, in the gospels. This one, welcome to Luke, but the most different of all the, uh, the synoptics, but they walk away from a full boat, which is different from walking away from, you know, James and John's father, you know, who was left behind there, like in Mark, but they walk, there's a lot of fish left behind here, which is testimony to what just happened. It's a lot of wealth that gets left behind. The, the tax agents, the tax collectors certainly know Jesus exists now because they see this boat full of fish that need to be taxed being drug in. You know, I mean, there's all sorts of things that this launches that now creates a question of where does this obedience lead us next, right? Are we going to keep you around so we can fish more often because you seem to be good luck? Uh, What kind of sacrifices are we going to make professionally, economically? How does this make us look dangerous now in the eyes of the authorities if stuff like this is taking place? There's all sorts of of interesting little um, things that affect the decision. A decision has to be made now because of what's just happened by yeah, surprise I th- in the midst of exhaustion too, when people don't usually make really good decisions about their future. Mm-hmm. No, I think that's a really, I think that's a great point. It goes back to Rolf's invitation. How would you say this? Do you say it from frustration, exasperation, exhaustion? Uh, and and then the, the emphasis here on the result which you get in the details. It's not just, you know, it, it's not just um, when they does it, they, they, you know, that they caught a lot of fish. It's, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. They had to have their partners in the boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. I mean, so that, that abundance there is, uh, is also key, as you noted, Matt, that what are they, what are they leaving behind? They're leaving behind this 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 really remarkable catch of fish. This you know this abundant catch of fish, and and which really then emphasizes verse eleven. They left everything, which is such a uh, powerful phrase. There, they, what is that? What is the everything? And so the way in which you capitalize on that or help people think about what that everything is, is important. 
I, I do think it's worth, uh, I, li I like, you know, what the direction, Matt, uh, of uh, comparing the call story in Isaiah and this call story in Luke, uh, because there are two different experiences of the, of the holy, first of all. And so there are different ways to that um, God's holiness is revealed to different people. So in Isaiah, it's an experience of angelic visitation. Uh, these seraphims whose voice is so loud that they make the building shake when they sing. Um, they come over and uh, talk to him. And he says, I and the people I'm around are so sinful. Just, uh, you know, you're going to have to get away. Um, the experience of holiness, as we've already talked about, is this amazing catch after having had nothing. Um, and then they both have the reaction of sinfulness. They recognize something about the experience of the holy makes both of them recognize their sinfulness. But then it's the response is different in Isaiah, it's forgiveness. Um, not a lot of fun to be forgiven this way. Um, touching a burning, uh, burning hot coal to your mouth to burn your sins away from you. Uh, it, but in Peter, it's or in Luke, it's not forgiveness. Uh, there is no, uh, oh, you're, hey. You're forgiven. Now you can come follow me. Rather, it's simply uh, from now on, you're going to be catching people. So I think it is very interesting, the differences. So what do you make of that? I mean, we you, you talked last week about how a lot of people in, in congregations don't recognize themselves as called in a particular way. This is a text that excites a lot of preachers people who are in professional ministry because they all have a call story that they've had to recite over and over again to candidacy boards and to seminary professors. Um, how does this not become a text that people say, I hope that never happens to me, or this must be how my pastor experienced things, or, or, or what? Because very few people have an experience like this where things are so clear, still scary, so you can't see the end, but where a decision gets made that's so life altering like this. I know we've talked about this before in past years, but it's, it's, it's a place where I think we can preach, assuming everybody knows what we're talking about and people don't, unless we're preaching to a room full of pastors, which I don't recommend. I think, so how do we help people? Uh, clarify the question again, because just your last comment about room full of preachers, well, I just think it's, I think if we're not careful as preachers, we, we make assumptions about what our congregation is hearing with a passage like this. Oh, yeah. Either because of our excitement or our sense of more familiarity with experiences like these. And so how do you, what's the goal? Do you want people to feel like, hey, I'm called to just like Peter was, I'm also a fisher of people, or this is how I understand the magnetism of Jesus, or I mean, what are they going to? Most people will probably hear the depart from me. I'm a sinful person. and would think, yeah, that's what I would say. Hopefully we all say that. Right. But you know what I mean? Like what's the, what's the, and obviously you don't have control over how a sermon's heard. We know all that, but well, I'll use language. Caroline will appreciate what's the function of a sermon like this. Mm. I know that well, depends, for, but. You know, for me, uh, I think it's the last it's the last verb, which is to follow um, that. And you can really pair this up with where we've been in Corinthians the last uh, couple of weeks. We, there's, we, all, we all have different gifts or different sets of gifts. Um, we're all called to follow in daily life. And uh, so what, is that, what does that look like? And not everybody's called to be uh, a pastor, uh, although we would like people to continue to come to seminary and uh, so that we would have our callings too. But I, everyone is called in daily life and most people need help. Um, so I'll tell this story from my own pastor who, uh, who recently asked his church council, um, do you know how to follow Jesus in daily life? And one of the women on his church council just opened her eyes and sagged in her chair and basically said, no, I don't know how to follow Jesus in daily life. Well, 
that's what uh, people are coming to worship for in one sense is so that they can hear the call and learn how to follow Jesus and, and teach each other how to follow Jesus. Maybe one thing is for the pastor to say, hey, I need help following Jesus. I don't know uh, how to do it every day. Uh, so that I need you to help teach me. How, but I think that the last verb is where I'd go. What about you, Carolyn? Oh, yeah, I've been sitting here thinking about that and wondering if I could just go to Isaiah. Actually, no, I wouldn't. But, uh, but no, I, uh, hmm. what, ought I, what would I want the function to be? Uh, I think I, I think I, again, I'm going to go back to yet, if you say so, that the function has something to do with uh, that, that uh, a, a kind of, mm, a kind of response, but you don't really know what that, why that response is happening. <laughs> there's something that you recognize, or there's something that you there's, there's something about Jesus or there's something about the moment that, that is, uh, that is catching you and grabbing you. Uh, maybe we see even say the spirit, but you can't explain it. I find it really interesting. All of the different kinds of sort of assumed emotions or responses in this, like uh, that, that you have Simon Peter saying, go away from me, Lord, for I am a, so there's a, there's a pushing, there's a pushing Jesus away of recognizing one's own sinfulness. Uh, there is, uh, there's amazement. Jesus, Jesus also intimates a kind of don't be afraid <laughs> and then following. And so this sort of mixture or plethora of responses and reactions is really interesting to me. And so that, that one can't predict actually necessarily what, how the, the kind of reaction or the kind of response you're going to have to, uh, to what happens when you obey or follow Jesus command. Uh, so I think, I think part for me, it, partly it's just sitting in that moment of wondering what happens if you, if, if you, if you respond, if you say so and do it. And where does that, because sometimes I think a lot of the, a lot of our responses to uh, call or responses to what is God, what is God calling us to do, get hung up in that moment. But if you say so, uh, or right before that moment, because uh, we were kind of paralyzed there of, of all of the possibilities of where that could take you and where that, what, what, where you might go and what that means for your life. And so we just stopped there. And so I, I think I want people to just sit there <laughs> and acknowledge all of the different kinds of ways in which we resist and why, and why we don't follow the call and why we don't, um, why we don't say, if you say so. Thanks, both of you. Yeah. Well, well we've already talked a little bit about Isaiah 6. Uh, first of all, my favorite Hebrew word of all is in this. Uh, of all I just time? Have to, of all time, my favorite Hebrew word. And it's translated here as pair of tongues. It's one word in Hebrew. It's got the dual ending. And so they take the word take, the verb take, and they make it into a participle, taker. And then they put a dual ending on it, a pair of takers. Makes me happy. And then they burn his lips, which doesn't make me so happy. Uh, I do love, though, also the two verbs for forgive. Uh, here, which I think, uh, I think play, the first word is departed to be gone. And so you can imagine if you've, if you, let's say you've got a stain in some garment, um, this is the thing that gets rid of it, you know, whether you, whether it's just something you like can brush pen. off or scrub out. Like a yeah. Tide pen. Yeah. Those are really and handy. Then, but the, <laughs> they are. You have tide pens tide, around. And then oh, the yeah. second one is blotted out, which reminds me, it, it's just the word to cover, which reminds me of whiteout. Do you remember the, uh, uh, oh, yeah. the, the liquid paper, basically, that uh, 
in the old days when uh, you didn't we had just, typewriters. Yeah, when we had typewriters or <laughs> pens, and then you'd have to cover it up and then redo it. But those are uh, those are images for the forgiveness of sins, which apparently in Isaiah six is the only quality that you need to follow God is you have to be forgiven, which I kind of like that too, as. Will Willimon said to, uh, to me not long ago, that's only because you're Lutheran. <laughs> Wasn't a compliment. <laughs> okay. Isaiah, uh, Psalm. I'm trying to get to my paper. Psalm 138. There we go. Yeah, again, again, Jerome Creech, always so helpful mm -hmm. on the website. By the way, last week, the book that I couldn't remember is The Destiny of the Righteous, which in the Psalms is God is the destiny in his refuge. Um, uh, this is, um, you know, here's a universal call to praise. You know, all the kings of the earth shall praise you. It's a ridiculous notion. Uh, we're, we're coming up to um, Transfiguration soon where... Uh, We'll be talking about God as King in the Psalms, but here it's it's this universal call to praise, which is uh, in the context of the ancient world. This tiny little this tiny little backwards country that's always been dominated by empire, whether it's Egypt or Assyria or Persia or Babylon or Greece or Rome, always dominated, and yet they say, you know, um, no, 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 this here, this is. The God you can meet here in the city is the universal God. Uh, it's, uh, it's really a remarkable witness. Um, so, but I talk about praise all the time, so. I was struck by this. I mean, I get how, you know, you can see how it's a nice pairing with Isaiah six, which, you know, has its own way of pairing with Luke five. But I like that it's a, a Psalm of Thanksgiving, which mm -hmm. one thing you might do is help people consider the question of what if the proper response to a calling isn't just service, but it's also gratitude and to help people get a sense of, well, the way the Psalm fits that, even though I know it's not really a Psalm about vocation or about calling or about outreach necessarily, at least not explicitly so, but to, to have it on this day. So what if one of the responses to Luke chapter five is to simply gratitude? despite all of the, the terror that comes from following this Jesus uh, to unknown places and uh, despite the, the tiresome nature of being obedient, that there's a sense of gratitude there. I, I don't know if also, you could use the psalm after the, serve, after the sermon. But I don't know what that would look like. I don't know if that's ever been done before. But oh, you mean like liturgically? Aren't all psalms used liturgically? <laughs> you yeah, have a good point there. Yeah, you do have a good point. Well, I think too that the way in which the the phrase in the psalm with my whole heart might be a way to paraphrase they left everything. Uh, and that that leaving everything means this this wholehearted uh, following. Uh, and and if you, you could even play off that a little bit about what part of your heart do you leave behind or uh, uh, it, it, that, but this calling to follow Jesus is this, this wholeheartedness. And that could be a way to, a, a way for preachers to think about leaving everything I think would be a good way to go. I also think there's something that, uh, that would pair back with, you know, a theme that you guys uh, were helping us see in Luke four, a few weeks ago. So in the middle of all this, about all these high things, like the kings, you know, the holy temple, all exalted, all these verbs for uh, mighty things, it says there, um, I just lost sight of it. Where is it? Here it is. For the Lord, for though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, picking up on that theme from Luke, uh, you know, from the first part of the inaugural sermon in, or is it from the second part? Uh, I think it's both actually, but especially well, yeah, the first then, part about the oppressed, you know, the blind, the, the well, poor. Oh, and going back to Luke one and two as yeah. well, that Mary herself so, sings that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is God's very nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's impossible for God not to do that, not to regard the lowly. Mm -hmm. First Corinthians 15. This is 
one of those texts that Bible nerds get really excited about because you've got an apparent early Christian confession, and this nice reminder that Paul isn't just making up theology all by himself, but is the recipient of a lot of things that were passed along to him, uh, not the only one who's helping train people, congregations, in theologizing. Hey, can I stop and ask you a question? Can I, can I interrupt to ask you a question about that, both you guys? Yeah, sure. I was about to say, but that's not really preachable, but that's fine. This is why people listen no, to but us, this. Right? So, but this is still a really important point. Um, there was a notion in the middle of the last century that Paul is a second inventor of Christianity. Uh, that really there's a great disjuncture in ch uh, between Jesus and Paul. I believe that notion has been largely um, dismissed. Um, but maybe you guys could talk about that. Well, you still hear it pop up in popular circles all the time that Jesus mm -hmm. was about common lived faith and Paul's about big concepts and ideas and power and institutionalizing power. I mean, you hear that all the time and it's mm -hmm. not really, well, I, don't, I mean, it's, yeah, you need to know how to answer back to that. I, I think by and large, though, to speak of Paul as somebody who has distorted something or, or turned Jesus's spirituality into a religion is pretty much unhelpful. Um, well, it, it's also connected to a kind of, of quest, if you will, <laughs> to, to portrait Paul in such a way as a masterful systematic theologian that somehow heard Jesus and or knew what Jesus teachings and now is like shaping um, theology for all time and all place. And, and the way in which that, that notion that you lifted up, Rolf, gets critiqued is the emphasis on, on Paul as, well, for lack of a better term, Paul as pastor, or Paul as contextual theologian and not systematic theologian, and that he is speaking directly into particular situations. And so that dynamism of Paul's theology, that, uh, you know, the quest for a theology of Paul is really at the end of the day, um, you're, you're not, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to get frustrated <laughs> every time you try, because Paul's theology is is reacting to and in response to the particular context in which he's preaching and so and I, I that's always a I think for when I teach preaching that's always a helpful thing for me to tell my students is that uh, preaching Paul is not defined you know this systematic theological nugget particularly that uh, affirms your own denominational commitments which is what, how we tend to interpret Paul uh, or want to preach Paul, but it really is Paul responding to what needs to be said. And I think, uh, you know, one of the things that's so striking about this passage, and I, one thing we need to say too, is just to remind preachers that as you're moving through Corinthians, this is the first of three passages in, in chapter 15. So we're, you know, we're doing all of chapter 15. But that, as you said earlier, Matt, that for I handed on to you, as a first importance, what in turn I in turn had received. And maybe for the preacher, just to sit back for a minute and, and take refuge, <laughs> if you will, in those words, uh, that, 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 that role of handing down uh, the, uh, the, the creed, handing down the confession of Christ dying, uh, Christ's death and, and uh, being buried, crucifixion and buried and raised, is that that's something that we're handing down. And I think it's a way to invite people into their own witness that uh, I think might be important that would really resonate with people when we're talking about call and when we think they think about, well, what difference does my, my life make about that, that witnessing to one's faith is about handing down. And, uh, and maybe that's maybe a, a balm for preachers right now too. You're, you're, calling right now doesn't mean that you have to come up with like these brilliant never said before aspects of the text or the, but that you are just you are handing down the promises uh and and maybe that's something that uh that you can trust in uh these sundays when you're not really sure what to say <laughs> 